I'm looking for my mom. Is my mom in the audience? Yes. Okay. Hi, everybody. So I'm going to talk to you today and start out our conversation by taking a little trip together in the Wayback Machine, all the way back to the year 1989. <laughs> I was in the third grade. And one day, my dad came a little bit early to pick me up from school, which is not so unusual. But it was a treat because I got to leave before everybody else. And normally, my mom took me to school and dropped me off. So I was really excited. I saw him come to the door of my classroom. I gathered up all of my things. And I leaned over to one of my classmates, all excited, and said, hey, that's my dad. Well, he looks at my dad and looks back at me and says, that's not your dad. Uh, I think I would know who my dad is, right? But he insisted, no, no, that can't be your dad. You must be, like, adopted or something. Well, here's what led to his confusion. This is my dad, Joe Lewis Bell. He was born and raised here in Oklahoma. And clearly, he is a black man and I am his daughter. Now this is my mom, the beauty, my mom. She was also raised here in Oklahoma, born and raised. She is my mom, and I am her daughter as well. So now, I'm biracial, right? We can move past that. <laughs> but I can tell you that I've had all sorts of conversations with people and normally, that's not the first thing they assume about me. They'll ask me, where are you from? And when I tell them, I'm from Norman, Oklahoma, and my dad was black, and my mom is white, they say, oh, cool, cool, cool. Oh, I just thought that you were, like, Italian, or, like, Lebanese, or Greek, or Native American. I mean, <laughs> if you look at this picture of me, in the third grade, you might have assumed any of those things too. Like, clearly I am a mess, but <laughs> where am I from, right? So, normally when this happens, I tend to give people a pass, because they may not have ever met anybody else besides me who's biracial. Now what the 2010 census tells us is that the number of people who self-identify as I do, as biracial, is growing, which is great. And what we'll learn with the 2020 census is that number is getting even bigger. In fact, the number of people of color in the United States is getting bigger all the time, which is awesome. But it can also lead us to uh, an assumption that just because there are more people of color in the United States, we're living in this beautiful post-racial place, right? You guys have heard this term, post-racial. Well, I don't mean to burst your bubble, but it turns out that racism is still alive and well in the United States. And just acknowledging that fact for a lot of people can be really difficult, and talking about it can be even more uncomfortable. I watched a TED Talk last year on the internet by Melody Hobson, one of my personal heroes now after seeing this talk. And in the talk, she could have done anything, okay? She's a high-powered uh, investment executive. She's married to a guy you might also know named George Lucas. Like, she could have done a whole talk about Oprah coming to her wedding, okay? And I still would have watched it. But much of the chagrin of her friends and colleagues who advised her against doing it, she did a talk about race. And in that talk, she said this. It's time for us to be comfortable with the uncomfortable conversation about race. We cannot afford to be colorblind. We have to be color brave. Right on, okay? That's what I thought. And I felt really good after seeing this talk. But what I realized was, I was far from being colorblind, but I wasn't really being color brave. I felt like a very conscious person who was reading all of the headlines about police brutality and inequities in our criminal justice system. 
but I wasn't really talking to anybody else about them, and I certainly wasn't doing anything about it. I realized that I need to get color brave. So what does that mean? Well, I can't just keep thinking about it anymore. And I realized that there are a lot of people in our community who probably have answers to all these questions that I had. Like, I see what's going on in the country, but I don't understand it completely. So I figured I'll start reading a little bit more. I'll start listening a little bit more. I'll try and reach out to these community members who know something about race and about race relations in the country. But what I realized was you can't really call somebody up who's an expert, really a stranger at all, and say, hey, yeah, it's Marilyn here. I have a lot of questions about race relations in America. Do you have a sec to chat? <laughs> like, I don't know them, so I can't very well just call them up, right? So on the way to work one day, I had a brainstorm. I thought, I should create a show, a radio show. That way I can have all these really smart people on as guests, and when they give me the answers to all these questions, I'll receive the answer, but then maybe the community can benefit from it a little bit as well. So, as Clark said, that show is called Race Matters. And what I've learned from doing interviews with people is that there are all sorts of ways to be color brave. I interviewed a man by the name of Jose Antonio Vargas. Some of you might know him as the director of a documentary that came out last year titled White People. Jose is passionate about talking about race. He's passionate about the topic of immigration reform. And when we sat down, he said something that really stuck with me. He said, I didn't think that my professional life would actually be much better and much fuller now that I'm honest with myself and with everybody else. What Jose has been honest about since 2011, I think, when he wrote a piece about it, is the fact that he himself is an undocumented immigrant. Now, I haven't met very many other people in the United States who are more committed to the American dream than Jose. But as it turns out, he was brought here by his grandparents when he was 12 years old from the Philippines, illegally, on falsified documents. But he still is honest with people. And what I learned from him talking about that honesty was that we all need to be a little bit more honest when it comes to the topic of race. Honest, first and foremost, with ourselves. I'll give you an example. I'll be honest with you guys right now. I still consider myself to be woefully ignorant when it comes to understanding the complexities of race in America, even as a biracial person. But I also interviewed somebody else named Rilla Askew. She's an author of many novels, but one in particular is called Fire in Beulah. And in that novel, she gives a historical account of the Tulsa race riots of 1921. Has anybody heard of this event? You guys, especially the ones who are younger than 30 <clears throat> something in the audience, probably know a lot more about that than me, which is great. But honestly, until last year, when I talked to Rilla about this subject and the subject of race in general, I knew little to nothing about that event. Now that's not something that I'm proud of, but it's something that I'm honest about because I feel like it's important, as Rilla points out to us in this quote, that we acknowledge that there are still things we don't know and move past them. So here's what Rilla said. The first thing that we have to do is educate ourselves. We cannot excuse ourselves by what we don't know. We are responsible for the truth of our history and there is no one alive today who's been paying attention in the least bit to the news, who does not understand that we have a terrible, terrible situation that continues to exist. What Rilla taught me about being color brave is that we have to stop making excuses. 
So I kind of stood up here earlier and said, I didn't know anything about race because I'm from this small town and it's mostly white. I went to school with a whole bunch of white kids and was taught by a whole bunch of white people and read books that were written mostly by white folks about things that are important to white people. <laughs> I know for a fact that there is a lot of our shared history as Americans that was casually omitted from my experience and my education. But I can't use that as an excuse. We're in a time now, such a critical time in American history, that we can't keep using excuses to justify why we don't know enough about race and we don't do enough about it. We have to be honest, as Jose told us, and we have to be willing to stop making excuses, as Rilla pointed out. Those are two steps to becoming color brave. So what can I tell you as some imparting advice about becoming color brave yourself? Well, Jose gave us some advice, Rilla gave us some advice, and I have one small nugget of advice after all of these interviews that I've done. You're gonna have to get a little uncomfortable. Talking about race, Doing something about it is not easy and it's not fun. Like talking to the smart people that I've talked to has had an immeasurable effect on my life, but it's been awkward, it's been fitful. For me, it's kind of like exercise, okay? I hate to exercise. <laughs> but when you go to the gym, and you're on that elliptical machine, you feel all weird, like you're all fists and elbows and you don't really know what the hell you're doing. <laughs> you know everybody in the gym is looking at you and they all think you're an idiot. You don't know what you're doing. That's how you're gonna feel when you start talking about race. That's how you're going to feel when you start these uncomfortable conversations, when you go to a protest rally Okay, but we still have to do it. Because think about where we might be in five years, in 10 years. At the end of your lifetime, will we really be in that post-racial place, that utopia that we all hope for? Well, I don't know if that's even possible at all, okay? But what I do think is possible is for us to come a little bit closer together to shut off the differences and do some of the really positive things that you've been encouraged to do by all the other speakers today. I know what I'm going to do to be color brave. What will you do? Thank you.